welcome to this lecture series on environment and ecology presented by mentors for is in association with bangalore is academy and nama kpsc so in this particular video we'll be discussing about the last function of an ecosystem that is homeostasis so we have already completed our discussion with respect to the other three functions of an ecosystem in the previous videos and in this particular video we will be complete homeostasis now depending upon the book or the source that you are going to use to read and understand about the functions of an ecosystem it is possible that homeostasis is not included as a function of an ecosystem because in many uh, situations it is actually debatable if homeostasis can be considered to be an, uh, uh, as a function of an ecosystem but we will not go into that aspect but we will just try to understand the entire concept of an ecosystem's function that is homeostasis in this particular video so what i'll be doing is that before moving on ahead uh to just explain the function of an ecosystem when it comes to homeostasis it would actually be better if we understand what is this homeostasis so in order to understand what is this homeostasis it would actually be beneficial for us to take the human system the human body itself as an example so generally i'm pretty sure you'd have heard of homeostasis this homeostasis actually refers to any self regulating process by which an organism tends to maintain stability while adjusting to conditions that are best for its survival so as it says here homeostasis is the maintenance of a stable equilibrium especially through physiological processes now for me to explain it to you the best example is always with respect to the body's ability to maintain and regulate its temperature but before i i actually go ahead with this i just want you to understand this particular concept as well which says that organisms try to maintain the constancy of its internal environment despite varying external environmental conditions that tend to upset its homeostasis now this you should be able to understand very clearly and the other important thing i want you to remember is that it also includes something known as negative feedback loops so i'll explain what these things are actually about okay so uh, try to relate my explanation with respect to this diagram over here okay so again the best example would always be the body's ability to maintain and regulate its temperature so normally your body's temperature should be around 37 degree celsius that is the normal body temperature that is 37 degree celsius now this is necessary for many reasons like maintaining concentration of various ions in the blood to maintain the ph level the stomach maintains the ph level concentration of glucose etc etc but now my question is what is the temperature of your surrounding environment what is the temperature of your surrounding environment is it always 37 degree celsius of course not it could be below 10 degree celsius in winter and it could also be above 40 degree celsius in summer then don't you think the body's temperature should also change and vary accordingly with respect to the season yes right obviously it should but what happens is that the body's temperature will always remain the same or at least very close to 37 degree celsius range and this is because the body regulates the temperature through something known as negative feedback loops i have already explained what is a negative feedback loop or even if it, even if you're not able to relate to this change in temperature i'm pretty sure whenever you try to exercise the body actually generates heat that is why you try to breathe in more heavily and breathe out more heavily because since the body's temperature increases you have to regulate the temperature and when you breathe heavily you are able to ensure that more heat is actually lost when you breathe out heavily that is what is happening and when you breathe it you are also taking in a lot of 
oxygen so i'll just try to explain what do you mean by negative feedback loops see first of all you have to consider a feedback loop you have to consider a feedback loop now a feedback loop is like an alarm system in your body that will trigger a certain result so you can have a positive feedback you can also have a negative feedback a positive feedback always tries to amplify something whereas a negative feedback always tries to inhibit something for example if you consider positive feedback say for example a person is injured now if that person is injured and if there is a cut on the body then obviously that person will start to bleed now what will happen is that the body will release certain chemicals to activate platelets in the blood for clotting once activated the platelets will release more chemicals to activate more platelets hence blood clotting this is positive feedback that is always trying to increase something it is always trying to increase something however when it comes to homeostasis it involves negative feedback for example when the body temperature increases now you can consider this particular diagram over here okay so when the body's temperature increases the brain sends signals to the sweat glands because we have to reduce the temperature increase we have to reduce the temperature increase and therefore we will start to sweat and the body temperature will eventually be reduced because we start losing heat to the outside environment but the problem is that if this continues then the body will start to cool down further if we don't if we don't stop this process of reducing this temperature increase then what will happen is that body may also start to cool down further to such a level which is not suitable now what will happen is that the brain will once again send a signal to stop the cooling process it will still start to send signals to start the cool to stop the cooling process hence there is a process to prevent increase in any direction that is either increase in temperature or fall in temperature so what can happen the blood vessels may constrict so that heat is conserved the sweat glands will not secrete any more so it's meaning you will not sweat any more therefore the loss of heat is prevented and heat is retained in the body so i hope you are able to understand the difference between a negative feedback and a positive feedback see in negative feedback it always provides for self regulation unlike positive feedback which always tries to increase something positive feedback tries to increase something whereas negative feedback tries to inhibit i'm not saying only decrease i'm saying it tries to inhibit something so in this case it is inhibiting increase in body temperature or it could be inhibiting fall in temperature see still if you if, if this particular concept is not very clear uh, try to take a factory for example now see obviously if you are considering positive feedback which always tries to increase something then i could say that uh, more the factory produces goods more should be the profit but at the same time if you consider negative feedback negative feedback will try to regulate production it will not simply try to increase the production of goods negative feedback will say that if you continuously increase the number of goods i may not have enough storage space therefore this could also lead to damage to goods and therefore i have to bring down the production rate at the same time if the production rate comes down to such a level that we are not able to make profit then we have to increase the production level so negative feedback provides for this self regulation so it inhibits loss at the same time it is inhibiting the production rate to come down to such a level that we are not able to earn any profit this this is the reason we always say that we need a negative feedback loop which which tries to bring about self regulation rather than a 
positive feedback which always tries to increase something so i hope this is clear with respect to this particular diagram so what i'm trying to say is that <coughs> the basic idea is that organisms should try to maintain stability when it comes to their internal environment despite the varying conditions of the external environment we have to maintain the internal environment when compared to the external environment over here so what we will do is we will see the different ways this can actually be done so for our explanation we'll take the example of unfavorable temperature so i am going to explain the different ways homeostasis can be achieved but for our understanding we will take the example of unfavorable temperature meaning the external temperature is not suitable and we have to adapt to this particular external temperature by maintaining homeostasis over here so then how do different so what we are going to discuss is it how do different animals cope with this unfavorable outside temperature so we have four types or we have four ways one is regulation one is conforming the other is migration and the last is suspension so the first uh, way of maintaining homeostasis is to regulate or regulation now this is what we have been discussing all the while very simple regulation is when uh, this internal body's system is trying to regulate the internal temperature in accordance with the external environment so birds mammals they are actually capable of something known as thermoregulation birds and mammals are capable of something known as thermoregulation now birds and mammals are actually endotherms they are warm blooded animals they are also known as endotherms and thermoregulation is capable so birds and mammals are capable of thermoregulation that is an internal mechanism to maintain the body temperature so warm blooded animals can increase or decrease heat loss by dilation of blood vessels or constriction of blood vessels respectively now this is what we have seen in the last uh, slide before this that is what i actually explained what i had explained in the last slide was all about regulation how we have stimulus in order to increase or decrease the temperature within the body in order to prevent the increase in temperature at the same time to prevent heat loss so this is what is going to happen either you can have constriction of blood vessels or you can have dilation of blood vessels with respect to whether you want to prevent heat loss or if you want more heat loss so since warm blooded animals are able to regulate they are actually found in extreme conditions from the antarctica to the sahara desert see for example if we go to antarctica it is a very close it, it is actually a very cold uh, area so therefore if you don't have this uh, mechanism known as thermoregulation species may not be able to maintain internal temperature that is why in such extremities you usually have warm blooded animals which are capable of thermoregulation which are able to maintain this internal temperature i am i am explaining this with respect to temperature because i told you i'll go through all the different ways only with respect to temperature but it is not restricted only to temperature at the same time it could also be with respect to behavior it can also take up certain behavioral mechanisms say for example in this particular image over here just as we humans cool off these uh you, you you could call them monkeys for the, at, uh, at this particular state uh, stage these monkeys are actually cooling off they they mostly apes so these apes are actually cooling off in a water body just as we humans are able to do so this is a behavioral mechanism at the same time we can make use of the negative feedback loop to maintain the internal temperature next is conform now this is with respect to ectotherms that is cold blooded animals okay so for this obviously the best example is cold blooded animals now they are not able to regulate their body temperature they are not able to reduce their body temperature and hence depend on the outside environment in order to regulate their body temperature like reptiles or amphibians 
so if it is very hot outside they will take shade under a tree or they will go underground say for example take a snake or a lizard if it is very hot outside then they are not able to maintain their temperature through thermoregulation they need external means so what will the snake or the lizard do the snake or the lizard will try to find shade at the same time if it is very cold outside then they will prefer sun bathing if it is very cold outside they will prefer sun bathing because they are not able to prevent heat loss so many animals have actually not evolved into in order to incorporate thermoregulation see obviously uh, it would be better if you have evolved to incorporate thermoregulation because you have an internal mechanism itself why depend on something else it is maybe it is maybe it uh, there a situation may arise where you are not able to find shade for example so why not have thermoregulation now many species have actually not evolved to incorporate thermoregulation because this process of thermoregulation is very expensive in terms of energy they need a lot of energy take very small animals for example like a hummingbird or a shrew so what will happen is that they have a very large surface area relative to their volume because of which they lose a lot of heat and would require a lot of energy to produce that heat through metabolism this is why they do not have very small animals in the polar regions because in order to maintain that internal temperature they should be able to produce or generate that heat but in order to generate that internal heat you would have to spend a lot of energy but these small uh, animals are not able to spend so much of energy use up so much of energy that is the reason if you go to the polar regions you will not find very small animals usually they are larger animals this is because they do not have the ability to use up so much of energy in order to produce heat to maintain their body warm so this is the second way then migration this is very simple some animals migrate like birds for example in order to escape the winter cold i'm pretty sure if you go to uh, rangantitu you should be able to see certain birds coming in all the way from siberia to escape the winter cold because here winter in india is very mild since we are very close to the equator so migration is another way to ensure homeostasis now this is very simple i'm pretty sure everybody understands migration and at last we have suspension now this is also very simple suspension is to combat unfavorable temperature what many animals do is that they will suspend their metabolic rate many animals will suspend their metabolic rate for example take a bear i'm pretty sure you would have heard of some animals going into hibernation yes so what happens is that bears in cold regions to avoid heat loss go into hibernation where the breathing rate the heart rate the metabolic rate they all go down in order to prevent heat loss conserve energy and conserve that heat within the body so as to maintain homeostasis because homeostasis is necessary for survival so these are the different ways that homeostasis can be achieved within an organism so this is with respect to the internal environment so now coming back to our discussion with respect to the ecosystem itself so the reason we are actually discussing homeostasis is because i have told you that the fourth function of an ecosystem is homeostasis so coming back to this uh, some actually suggest that the ecosystem itself will function as a super organism and therefore try to maintain homeostasis by actively modifying the environment to produce necessary environmental conditions required for stability or equilibrium but what i want you to remember is that this equilibrium in an environment or in an ecosystem this equilibrium is actually dynamic equilibrium meaning continuous changes occur to maintain relatively uniform conditions now let me give you an example for this same bandipur okay same bandipur 
the number of tigers the number of tigers actually increase then what will happen they will kill and feed on more deer the tigers will kill and feed on more deer when more deer are consumed their number reduces their number reduces when the number of deer reduce there is scarcity of food and hence the number of tigers also reduce due to starvation so now what when the number of tigers reduce the number of deer will increase so after some time the tigers will also start to increase in numbers so more or less the number of tigers and deer in bandepur will remain constant on an average over a period of time so don't you think bandepur is actually maintaining this balance between tigers and deer don't you think this is homeostasis this is what is the function of an ecosystem always to maintain this balance if this balance is not maintained then the ecosystem may collapse that is why we actually say that the ecosystem also has a way to maintain this stability or equilibrium but this equilibrium is maintained through changes the changes that i have just discussed over here however i also want you to remember the ability to maintain homeostasis is not unlimited in an ecosystem it does not mean that uh, no matter what happens it will always be able to bring about this equilibrium and we have seen that human intervention actually disrupts this system uh, so i hope you have actually understood the uh, fourth function of an ecosystem if you do have any doubts uh, please do write in the comment section thank you